It is often said that media technologies provide us with a window on the world, beyond our own experience. A window not only connecting us to a distant world, past our immediate reach, but also to one which we can join into and share simultaneously. One term for describing how media afford this window to the world is liveness. The most obvious example is live news coverage. Journalism that is valued because it's on location, at the event, brought to you, the viewer, live. But liveness is not just live coverage. It refers to mediated experiences that place a priority on the value of now over later. Liveness is a kind of experience which very often tends to rely on centralized media. Broadcasters, social platforms, they are the privileged means of accessing such live experiences, perhaps increasing their power along the way. Media Technology and Culture is a podcast series by me, Scott Rogers. In this series, we'll be taking a thematic look at media, understood as technologies. We'll explore the histories of media, as well as more recent developments, and not always necessarily in a linear progression. Some of you listeners will also be students in my module, Media Technology and Culture, in which we'll discuss and work on some of these themes in more detail. This episode is the fourth in our series, focused on live technologies. Our aim is not to just introduce theories and research on the liveness of media, it is also to get across this key idea. Many of the media technologies we use offer liveness, but this liveness is about more than real-time transmission. At the broadest level, it is about the shared experience of simultaneity. Let's start by going to a scene. Yeah, well, I, but I'd like to pick up the natural audio from down there. Pick up natural sound from down there. It's the 24th of November, 1963. News media from across the United States and from around the world have descended on the police and courts building in Dallas, Texas. The police have in their custody a man named Lee Harvey Oswald. Oswald has been apprehended a couple of days earlier in a local cinema. He was suspected in the shooting of a police officer. Early the next morning, police would also charge Oswald with another shooting, which occurred 45 minutes before that of the police officer the assassination of U.S. President John F. Kennedy. Now that he has been charged, he is to be transferred to the Dallas County Jail. The news media have been clamoring for access to Oswald, and so far, the police have largely obliged. They have addressed the press about Oswald, they've displayed his fingerprints, and they've walked the prisoner himself past the camera on a number of occasions. Now, in the basement of the Dallas Police and Courts building, the media await the transfer of Oswald. It is to be a sort of perp walk, but not at the behest of the Dallas police. It is quite unlike the coordinated practice seen, for example, in New York City today, with police parading accused white-collar criminals such as Russell Crowe or Dominique Strauss-Kahn in front of a deliberately gathered news media. The pressure here is from the news media. The Dallas police have been wavering, making various aborted attempts to transfer Oswald covertly. But they have acquiesced. Many television broadcasters are here, in the basement, Large cameras mounted onto five-foot tripods being wheeled around, their cables strewn about. We can draw here on some of the reporters' accounts, specifically Bob Huffaker, Bill Mercer, George Fenix, and Wes Wise, collected in the 2004 book, When News Went Live. CBS's coverage is being run out of New York City. In the newsroom is its anchor, Harry Reasoner. Nelson Benton, the network correspondent, is in the van outside the police and courts building in Dallas. And in the basement is Bob Huffaker, the local CBS affiliate reporter. The plan is that, at the moment Oswald is brought out, Benton will narrate from the van, with Huffaker holding the mic and collecting natural sound. The basement is packed, around 50 reporters and 75 police officers. Nobody is paying attention to a man near Huffaker, dressed in a sharp suit and hat. Perhaps they think he's a Secret Service agent. Just as a blue Ford backs down into the basement, Oswald is brought out quickly by cowboy hat-wearing police detectives. And at that moment, the sharply-dressed man with the hat lunges forward, shooting Oswald in the lower chest at point-blank range. This is the basement floor of the Dallas City Hall, and that's a scuffle on the basement floor. Meanwhile, CBS is running coverage of Kennedy's coffin leaving Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C. Suddenly, the image jolts over to anchor Harry Reasoner. 
We are now switching to Dallas, where they are about to move Lee Oswald and where there's a scuffle in the police station. He's been shot, Lee Oswald. We're going to Oswald has been we shot. We to switch now. Police. Benton, narrating from the van, clearly does not recognize what has happened. In the background, Huffaker has heard repeating, Oswald has been shot. They are talking over each other. Neither knows if they are being heard. But eventually, Benton hands over to Huffaker, who breathlessly recounts what seems to have happened. Down in the basement of the courthouse, who is close to the scene. Go ahead, Bob. The situation is now that Lee Harold Oswald has been shot. The man who saw the shot fired said it was fired by a man wearing a black hat, a brown coat, a man that everyone down here thought was a Secret Service agent. The Oswald was moved immediately from the area. No one knows at this time where Lee Harold Oswald is. Uh, at the present time, word is that an ambulance is being ready to take Oswald away. We can hear sirens outside, and an ambulance apparently is moving down now into the basement. Here comes the ambulance. Police link up with arms to create a barrier around the vehicle. The backside of one of the officers, Sergeant Pat Dean, is right in front of the CBS camera. Huffaker knows the sergeant from his days as a police beat reporter and asks him to move so the camera can have a clear view. Pat, can you move? Pat, move just a little to your left. Dean obliges, crouching down and then moving to his left, partially out of view. Oswald is then brought into view on a stretcher. Here comes Oswald. He's, he is ashen and unconscious at this time, now being moved in. He's not moving. He's in the ambulance now. And attendants, police are quickly climbing in. They're now having to remove the armored truck from the... After the ambulance is filmed leaving the basement and heading off to the hospital, the shot jumps back to CBS anchor Harry Reasoner. We are back at headquarters in New York. We have, uh, we got our tape. We have re-racked the video tape that shows that whole scene of confusion. We will now roll it and you can see it as it happens. The video of the shooting is then replayed, including Benton and Huffaker talking over one another. He has been shot. Oswald has been shot. Lee Oswald. We're going to... Oswald has been shot. We are going to switch now, Lee. With Oswald off to the hospital, Huffaker turns to Sergeant Dean and begins asking questions. Now then, thus far, Pat, is the man upstairs in the cell? As far as I know, he's either in uh, the jail or at Captain Fritz's office. Did he get I up? imagine do he you, would probably be in jail. Do you know this subject? Do you know him? Have you seen him before? Yes, I do. Is he from Dallas? Yes. Who is is he? I, I couldn't tell you. I, I know, know you can't release the name now, but uh, do you know what kind of business he happens to be in? I, Bob, I, I wouldn't want to say. Right. Okay. As Huffaker later recounts, he had him, quote, in an awkward position, a policeman thrust onto national television in the vortex of a national tragedy, and I was trying to protect him while trying to get the facts. In some respects, this event seems to embody liveness on the hoof, unprepared, needing to be improvised. No doubt it was a watershed in what could happen unexpectedly through the technical conditions of a live television broadcast in front of a huge audience. And yet, the whole event was deeply prefigured by the norms, knowledge, organizational structures, and technical apparatuses of U.S. broadcast news in the early 1960s. This was a perp walk done under pressure from the news media. Broadcasters had laid careful plans around how they would cover the event. Plans that fell apart, sure, but they were still plans. And when events suddenly shifted, what seemed like both individual and organizational instinct kicked in around what to do next, what to ask, who to ask, and the camera shots needing to be established and captured. There was one other important observation to make as well. Though this was television's first live murder, it's not just live in the sense of being in real time. Recall that CBS largely misses the event itself. It needed to re-rack the video, offering its audiences a replay. It's a reminder that liveness is not necessarily just about the transmission of real-time events. It is more general. It is about sharing and indeed creating any simultaneous mediated experience. Thomas A. Edison, the inventor of the phonograph, has never before permitted his voice to be recorded for the public. Today, however, he has a message for you that is important enough to cause him to break his long-established rules. Mr. Edison, we now give you that message. 
I beg to introduce Mr. Thomas A. Edison. Karen Van Es, in her 2017 essay, Liveness Redux, in the journal Media, Culture, and Society, draws on Philip Oslander's 2008 book, Liveness, Performance in a Mediatized Culture, to trace the origins of the term live. In our last episode on domesticated technologies, we discussed how the phonograph remediated sound recordings from live events into the home environment. Radio was distinct in that it made possible direct transmissions of live sound, such as music, over the airwaves, without translation via recorded sound. But, Oslander notes, since radio listeners could not always distinguish between the sound that was recorded and that which was transmitted at the time of production, radio broadcasters deployed a new term, live. Van Ez's essay summarizes arguments she makes in her 2016 book, The Future of Live. This book reckons with the links that the idea of liveness has with broadcast media, and especially television. Its aim, though, is to reimagine liveness today, particularly after the rise of social media. Venez's key argument is that scholarship on liveness has tended to take one of three perspectives. The first is an ontological perspective. This emphasizes the givenness of liveness within certain media technologies. This sort of perspective is seen, Venez suggests, in academic writing around the advent of radio and television broadcasting especially. The problem with much of this literature is that it implies a direct connection between the technical capacities for real-time transmission and the rise of liveness as a cultural phenomenon. The former is too often seen as a cause of the latter. The second typical perspective is phenomenological. This emphasizes the human experience of liveness. The strength of this approach is that it looks very carefully and systematically at how a sense or feeling of simultaneity or a shared world is created and sustained between media producers and their audiences or users. For Van Ez, the problem with phenomenological approaches is that they myopically focus on the local, situated experience and downplay larger scale influences, such as that exerted over time and space by media institutions or technologies. The third perspective is rhetorical. This emphasizes the expression of liveness as a linguistic or ideological concept. Van Hez suggests that this way of thinking about liveness tends to focus on how particular media industries distinguish and elevate their own status by framing what they do as live. But there are two main limitations to this approach. One is that so much attention gets directed to how live is constructed or framed within a media text, such as a television program. The second is related to the first, in that there is an assumption that media institutions can define something as live within the content they produce, and audiences will largely accept the label. Vanez recognizes that each of these approaches, ontological, phenomenological, and rhetorical, offer some value for understanding liveness, but they are also in their own ways too limiting or narrow in their perspective, while also embodying approaches rooted in analyzing the age of television. On their own, they are poorly equipped to grapple with the emerging forms of liveness. For Vanez, liveness is a complex social construction produced through the interaction of media institutions, technologies, audiences, and users. This conception of liveness draws heavily on media sociologist Nick Coldry's work on media rituals. In a 2004 article in the journal Communication Review, Coldry argues that liveness does not depend on particular technologies or specific rhetorical framings, It has not vanished, for example, with the rise of time-shifting technologies, starting with the video recorder. Liveness is an enduring and complex phenomena, Coldry says, woven from a chain of socially and culturally shaped ideas. The first of these ideas is that liveness offers us access to something of broader or more central significance, something we feel compelled to access now rather than later. You might see here a looser idea of liveness, It is not just when television, for example, transmits programs or events happening simultaneously, such as on-the-scene coverage of an unfolding crisis or disaster, or perhaps occasions such as a sports match, parade, or concert. It is a more general quality of being tied in to a larger world. The second idea is that this us all tied together into this larger world are not random or accidental. We are part of various social groups, groups which are partly shaped by our uses of and exposure to various media, but which also shape the value different forms of media have. 
The value of something being alive is in other words derived within a social context. At the simplest level, this might be about talking with people around the proverbial water cooler. At the more complex end, it might be about the significance in time accorded to political acts such as casting a vote or partaking in a demonstration. The final idea noted by Coldry is that this liveness is accessed primarily through certain privileged media institutions. This is not an appeal to the power of good old-fashioned media. Even in an age of proliferating social media and user-generated content, we continue to primarily respond and orient ourselves to centers of media power. For example, the content of large-scale media companies like Netflix, not to mention to celebrities, all the while inhabiting the spaces created by large-scale digital platforms. She's got like a proper like strong like, what can I say, like an old school R&B like singer, like a... Whitney S. Yeah. Oh, it gave me goosebumps, did that? Oh no, I was just about to say, I'm getting like shivers. And she's something else. Ooh, get up there. Get up there, my love. Love, yeah. That was a bit screamy. That last bit, just the well, last bit. You can bit. say that about Tina Turner and everybody else, can't you, when they start rattling and knocking about? All right, it's just my opinion. The right? BAFTA award-winning British program so Gogglebox, launched in 2013, in many ways crystallizes the chain of socially and culturally shaped ideas of liveness described by Coldry. Viewers are presented with other viewers watching various programs. Not simultaneously, of course, at the same time as they are broadcast, but contemporaneous to the broader time frame in which the viewed programs are rooted. In other words, there's a reason to watch Gogglebox now, more than later. The viewing households shown also are intended to embody a representative mix of different Britons. Stephen and Christopher, a gay couple in Brighton, Sandy and Sandra, two black women in Brixton, and the Siddiqui family, a father and his sons in Derby. And, of course, the content they are watching is a selection of some of the most popular programs and live coverage provided by mainstream television. Not to be overly traditional, in 2017, a spin-off appeared on E4, Vlogglebox, which featured 16 to 24-year-olds watching various bits of content on their mobile devices. My Parents tell their kids how they lost their virginity. Korean. No, thank you. I don't even want to know. I do. No, I don't. No, I don't. No, I don't. No, I don't. <laughs> we made the video. Do you remember when you said that <laughs> mum and dad have already done it twice? Once to have you and once to have me. <laughs> Obvious. In recent years, we've also seen convergent examples of liveness via the phenomena of social TV. For a significant share of the audience, the viewing experience of programs in the UK, such as X Factor, The Bodyguard, BBC Question Time and, yes, Gogglebox, have been augmented through overlapping yet also fragmented conversations on Twitter. Social TV, Van Es points out, is attractive for television producers since it produces a new environment that encourages audiences to experience programs as soon as they are broadcast or released. Social media environments also promise instant feedback, even to the point of informing future production decisions. The phenomena of social TV is also attractive to platforms, of course, since it provides a focal point for conversations. It not only brings users to the platform, but it keeps them there. Win-win. color I see, then you maintain the status. December 7th, 19th. I'm gonna question a psychopath. The Orbi has nothing to fear. Given our particular interests, it seems worthy to spend just a little more time considering how technical qualities might create certain conditions for mediated liveness. This is particularly important if the concept is understood more broadly than simply simultaneous transmission. Annie van den Over, in a fascinating comparison of the aesthetics and viewing regimes of cinema and television, in the 2012 edited book Audiences, points out, for example, the small size of early televisions. Early television screens were no larger than 12 to 16 inches, and even into the 1990s, typically no larger than 20 to 26. This led to a focus on sound, to compensate for the relative lack of visual information, and frequent use of close-ups, to make material, especially human faces, on the screen appear at the same scale as the viewer. These qualities did not determine television's viewing conditions, yet they did underscore television as a more unexceptional, everyday perceptual engagement, contrasting with cinema. They meant television could recede, which is to say, the act of viewing would become highly medium unaware. 
but also viewing television could be experienced as an almost neutral window on the world, frequently populated, for example, by talking heads that were at the scale of the viewer. It's also worth thinking about how the technical qualities of media forms hold the potential for liveness, even if they are not being used that way at any given moment. As Joshua Merovitz put it in his 1985 book, No Sense of Place, quote, there is a big difference between listening to a cassette tape while driving in a car and listening to a radio station, in that the cassette player cuts you off from the outside world while the radio station ties you into it. Even with the local radio station, you are in range of any news about national and world events, end quote. Computation devices offer this potential in multitudes. Say you are reading the Van Es article we've been discussing on your computer screen. Depending on your settings, at any moment, notifications may alert you to current events, news, or messages. You may even have another application open, like your web browser, nudging another window on the world into your peripheral view. A focus on media as experience does not necessarily downplay the importance of technologies either. Rather, that sort of perspective concentrates on the way that technologies become so embedded into our daily practices that they become withdrawn from our perception. So back to the useful, if cliched, Heideggerian example of the hammer. Patty Scannell discusses liveness in his 2013 book, Television and the Meaning of Live. He argues that we should not think of liveness, quote, as if it were a technological effect, a peculiar technical quality of the medium itself. The essence of technology consists in what we have made of things, how technologies like television tell us in their user-friendly ways about who and what we are, end quote. So how's everyone doing? Are you guys going to watch, well, it's already on, but the Keisha Cole and the Shanti, what are badges for? I don't even know. Honestly, some more, I don't even know what they're for. Um, I just have them on because they say turn them on. So I just turned them on, but I would like to see the comments. You're hearing Sky than... Jackson, an American oh, actor, yeah, author, yeah. and YouTuber, interacting with some of her followers during a Instagram live stream. Recent years have shown very clearly the eagerness of social media platforms to adopt the brand or mantle of live beyond so-called social TV. In November 2021, Twitter added a new transitory feature called Fleets, it denotes a kind of contribution to the platform which automatically disappears after 24 hours. Live streaming video has become a major feature on Facebook, hosting all manner of performances, tours, and events where users can add questions, comments, and reactions synchronously with the video. And over on Instagram, owned by Facebook, users are presented with a colorfully ringed profile photo denoted with the word live when a user they follow streams a video. Van Es says that we should be careful not to conflate constructions of liveness with those around real time. Liveness, Van Es argues, points to something that has been socially worked at or achieved, usually by a media institution or a platform. Real time, by contrast, tends to be used to refer to or even celebrate the technical performance of a system. And yet, oftentimes, social platforms seem to have reserved the term live for video, even though users' experiences of such platforms might more generally be argued to exhibit liveness. That is, if, again, we see liveness at the broadest level as about a shared experience of simultaneity. Most users experience a social media platform through some kind of feed. Feeds are streams of content, such as the contributions of other users, ordered in a sequence. The sequence may be based on the time the user added their post, or it may be determined by the platform's feed algorithm, which might present content in an order tailored to the user accessing that feed. Feeds are one of the principal ways that social media users are afforded a shared, simultaneous experience on a platform. And yet there is a paradox. As Welt of Red, Helmut, and Gerlitz argue in a 2014 article in the journal Theory, Culture, and Society, such feeds do not literally transpire in real time. Users are not interacting synchronously, as they might, for example, in a Zoom video conference. Social media threads are not like that at all. They are fundamentally asynchronous. This is easy to see if you dig a little and look closely at the content in a social media feed you yourself use. On Twitter or Facebook, for example, it is relatively easy to observe a time series in which a, for example, video is uploaded, then attached to a post, and then at various subsequent points, commented on, reacted to, and shared. 
So our asynchronous social media feeds live? Maybe in this instance, it is not so helpful to get caught up in the precise meaning of that particular term. More important is to ask, do these feeds produce a shared simultaneous experience? All the evidence suggests that the answer to this is yes. For Welt of Red, Helmand, and Gerlitz, one task for researchers is to study the myriad tools, settings, functionalities, nudges, and features that platforms have devoted to the production of a real-time-like experience. Indeed, the question is not really whether social media actually operates in real time. Rather, it's how their technical operations and user practices forge specific experiences that Welt of Red, Hellman, and Gerlitz call real-timeness. Now, in each of our last few episodes, I've again and again ended on comments around what might broadly have been called new media, at least in the early 2000s. One question we have yet to address is what might specifically be new about some of the media technologies that are emerging today. We'll partly answer this in the next episode, when we address computational technologies. So until then, I'm Scott Rogers, and you've been listening to Media Technology and Culture. Thank you.